the Metropolitan Museum of Art for this exhibition and for this conference. <laughs> 41 years ago, the Louvre opened its first exhibit of comic art, and it's taken America 41 years to honor its own. With the Met being our premier art museum, probably one of the premier art museums in the world, this is so important to every creator, every writer, every artist, every editor who's ever worked in the comic book business. It validates their work, it celebrates their work, and it's an important day for them. I have to begin with one of my favorite quotations. It's by former Columbia University professor Mason Cooley, and it's simply this. Clothes makes a statement. Costumes tell a story. And what a story America's superheroes tell. Every culture, every religion, since the days the first paintings were rendered on the walls of caves, have passed down folk tales and legends of heroes and villains, gods and mortals, warriors and monsters, heroines and damsels in distress, Osiris, Ra, and Isis, Odin, Loki, and Thor, Hermes, Poseidon, and Heracles, Mercury, Neptune, and Hercules, Flash, Aquaman, and Superman. It's crystal clear. The ancient gods of the Egyptians, of the Norse, of the Greeks, of the Romans, they all still exist, only today they wear spandex and capes. Comic book superheroes are our contemporary folklore, our modern day mythology, passed along through graphic storytelling with the gloss of today and the promise of tomorrow. Gloss is the key word here. And the gloss that makes any true superhero stand out is his costume. It all began in June 1938 with the first appearance of the world's first superhero. Created by two teenagers from Cleveland, Superman was different from anything that had ever come before. Or was he? Was this story really about a strange visitor from another planet? Or was Superman simply the ultimate immigrant as conceived by two first-generation Jewish kids in Cleveland? For the answer to that, I need, you to take, I need to take you back on a brief journey to the early 1970s when I was a student at Indiana University in Bloomington. IU's College of Arts and Sciences had begun an experimental curriculum department in the College of Arts and Sciences. If anyone had an idea for a course that had never been taught before, and it could, if they could get the backing of a major department at the university, they could appear before a panel of deans and professors and pitch the idea for a course and try to get it accredited to teach on the university. Well, with the backing of the IU Folklore Department, I went in to pitch my comic book superheroes as modern day mythology course. Let me set the scene. My hair was down to my shoulders. I was wearing a Spider-Man t-shirt. I was wearing my love beads. And I was carrying a pile of comic books under my arm. I entered this dark mahogany office with a long conference table. It looked exactly like the secret sanctum of the Justice League of America. At the end of the long conference table was the dean, looking down at me over those little half glasses perched on the edge of his nose. He said, so you're the fellow who wants to teach a course on funny books at my university? And I knew I was in deep trouble. But I launched into my pitch. The dean let me speak for about two or three minutes and then cut me off. Mr. Uslan, I don't buy your theory that comic books are some form of a modern day mythology. All they are are cheap entertainment for children. Nothing more, nothing less. Look, when I was a kid, I read Superman comics. I read every issue I could get my hands on. You can't tell me Superman was contemporary folklore. I said to the dean, may I ask you two questions? He said, ask me anything you like. I said, are you familiar with the story of Moses? He said, yeah. I said, very briefly, could you give me a synopsis of the story of Moses? Well, he folded his arms and he sat back in his chair and looked at me and he said, I don't know what game you're playing here, but I will play this with you. He said the Hebrew people were being persecuted and their firstborn were being slain. A Hebrew couple placed their infant son in a little wicker basket and sent him down the river Nile. There he was found by an Egyptian couple who raised him as their own son. When he grew up and learned of his heritage, he became a great hero to his people by, I said, that, that's great, thank you very, very much. I said, you mentioned you read Superman comics when you were a kid. Do you remember the origin of Superman? Sure, he said. 
the planet Krypton was about to blow up. A scientist and his wife placed their infant son in a little rocket ship and sent him to Earth. <laughs> there he was discovered by the Kents, who raised him as their own son. When he grew up and learned of his heritage, and then he stopped, and he stared at me for what I swear was an eternity, and he said, your course is accredited. <laughs> and so with Superman, we not only have the world's first superhero, but also the beginning of a modern day mythology emerging from America's comic book pop culture. But what does a superhero look like? His co-creator, artist Joe Schuster, drew on what he knew, what he saw as a child at the circus. After all, who are the closest people in real life that could be faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound? Who else but the circus strongman, the man on the flying trapeze, the human cannonball, and that brave lion tamer? This first picture is the earliest known Joe Schuster drawing of his heroic Superman. Clad in only a t-shirt and pants, devoid of a symbol or a cape, the Superman is immediately compared to the Roman god Hercules in strength. This is where it all began. By the time he was finally published in 1938, with an S symbol on his chest, red cape, briefs, and boots, Superman resembled the most super circus performer of all, and the superhero costume was born often referred to by artists and writers of the day as the hero's union suit. Not only did a super suit have to be colorful and iconic, but also utilitarian. Utilitarian enough to be worn under a regular business suit and able to be changed into within the confines of a classic telephone booth. God help Clark Kent today in the age of cell phones. Now, it's true that a number of early superheroes avoided the leotard look and launched their superhero careers in men's suits and fedoras, sometimes complemented by a cape or a cloak or a trench coat, but always complemented by a mask of one sort or another. The Shadow, the Green Hornet, the Blue Beetle, the Crimson Avenger, the Sandman, and the Spirit follow this fashion trend. The world's second superhero, however, took a distinctly different route, starting a trend in costumes based on winged creatures. Enter the Batman. Writer Bill Finger put these words into Bruce Wayne's word balloons. Criminals are a superstitious, cowardly lot, so my disguise must be able to strike terror into their hearts. I must be a creature of the night, black, terrible. As if in answer, a huge bat flies through the open window. Bruce responds, a bat, that's it. It's an omen, I shall become a bat. Batman was an instant hit and was soon followed by other superhero winged wonders as Hawkman, whose origin was tied to Egyptian mythology. And while we're looking at, with, at these images here, take a look at the flash on top. He's actually wearing the very same winged helmet once worn by the Roman god Mercury. Dapper, very, very dapper. Well, if flying creatures were inspiring successful superheroes, it was only natural that the creators would spread their wings and turn next to wild animals. These new wild animal code names and costumings began with Bill Finger and Erwin Hasen's Wildcat, there on the bottom left. But in 1940, a new fashion statement was being made in the world of superheroes, and it was all about color. We had already seen them in hot colors, like the Flash and Captain Marvel, who shared red shirts with yellow lightning bolts. And there was, of course, the all-red Human Torch, America's foremost flaming superhero. Ah, <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Superheroes also came in cool colors, ranging from Superman's blue tights and Batman's gray tights to the new color of choice, green. Again, Bill Finger with Marty Nodell introduced the modern-day version of Aladdin and his magic lamp in the form of Green Lantern. Green was suddenly in, and it was easy being green. I mean, how many people have heard of the red bee, the yellow jacket, blue streak, silver streak, or golden girl? But Green Lantern, Green Hornet, Green Arrow, everybody knows them. 